Season 2 of MuniCast is brought to you by Sastel's innovation and collaboration team. Sastel can help you sort through the noise to create solutions that add value quickly. Whether it's reducing your environmental footprint, driving investment, community development, or just saving money, contact your Sastel account manager to find out more. Live from the SUMA office, this is MuniCast, the municipal podcast that tackles leadership and how you can learn by looking back to the past. On today's episode, we're very excited to be sitting down with former Premier of Saskatchewan, Lauren Calvert. Premier Calvert served as the 13th Premier of Saskatchewan from 2001 to 2007 in the Saskatchewan New Democratic Party until 2009. Welcome, Premier Calvert. It's great to have you on the podcast. Well, thank you very much, Sean. It's great to be with you. I think we'll start uh, off our interview today by drawing some comparisons between yourself and those that listen to this interview. Our listeners are comprised of mayors and councillors from across the province that have all stepped up to serve their community for specific reasons. So, Mr. Calvert, what inspired you to run for office and put your name forward for the Saskatchewan legislature all those years ago? Well, Sean, you know, I expect it will be the same with <clears throat> those who are on municipal councils or serving as mayors or reeves. I, I, I was living in my hometown of Moose Jaw. And if we have the opportunity to serve uh, with our own friends and neighbors in our own hometown, that, that was an incentive for me to run at, at that time. I also come to public life from a position of faith. And it's always seemed to me that it's, it's not simply enough to pray for a better world, but we need to, uh, to work for that better world uh, where we can and in the, in the ways that we can. Just at the time that I, I decided to run initially for elected office, um, our community in Moose Jaw, we were suffering an economic downturn. At that point in time, I was a student of economics. And I was, uh, I was un- upset by the kind of levels of deficit and debt that our provincial government at the time was racking up, bringing us almost to, a, to bankruptcy. Meanwhile, I could see in my own community with work I was doing with the, the food bank, for instance, that, uh, that poverty was, was on the rise and families were being hurt. Uh, so there was much, I believe, that needed to be tackled publicly. But at the end of the day, and I, again, I suspect this may be true of, uh, of many who find themselves in elected office. I, at the end of the day, I ran because I was encouraged to run by people that I deeply respected. Um, and it, it wouldn't matter if you're going to be a coach of a hockey team or a choir leader or, or seek elected office. It's often because we've been encouraged uh, by others by friends, by relatives, by people we respect uh, to do just so. And I think in my case, that that was certainly true when I ran for the first time. And it was true also when I sought the leadership of the New Democratic Party. It was uh, much because of, of the encouragement of others. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right that uh, it comes down to the encouragement of others. That's a common sentiment we hear from every mayor and councillor out there is that they're brought in and uh, they're asked to step up for leadership and lead their community. And, And many of them do so with kind of a great respect Mm -hmm. for those that came before. So I really appreciate you sharing that. And Sean, if I might just say, then it becomes, I think, incumbent upon us who have, uh, who occupy elected office or who have occupied elected office to encourage others, to encourage uh, new generations, uh, people like yourself, Sean, who who can uh, step forward and assume the leadership roles. I think part of our role, once we're out of politics and out of elected office, Part of the role is to encourage others to do it. So taking yourself all the way back to 2001, and this is your first day as Premier of Saskatchewan, what is one thing that you wish someone would have told you that would have helped you throughout your political career? Oh, you know, you know, Sean, on this, on this question, I think I could write a book um, on the things that I wish I knew then that I know now. If I had to, to summarize into one, one learning or, or bit of advice, what I wish I knew then is how easily the urgent can crowd out the important in public life. You know, I used to say in government, it's one darn thing after another darn thing. So why am I upset when another darn thing arrives? But the fact of the matter is that particularly in elected office, while it would be in the case in any, 
any organization we're leading or part of, um, there's always something urgent that will demand your attention. Yeah, there's always another pothole. There's always an, another complaint. And these urgent matters must be dealt with. There's no alternative. You must deal with those things which present as urgent. But at the same time, they have the capacity to um, crowd out the important issues in your agenda. I believe leadership means having some deep convictions, uh, seeking some perhaps bold initiatives, but it's just too easy for the urgent to push us off of those important agendas. Sean, if there's one thing that, I, that, I've, that I've learned since that first day I was sworn in as premier, or perhaps I, I should have known but didn't, is that one of the real tasks of leadership is to keep your eye on the important, to deal with everything else that comes along, to deal with all the urgent issues, to deal with all the personalities and so on to keep one's eye on the important and, and part of leadership is to keep your team's eye on that which is important and not to be driven off agenda by, by what, what are sometimes significant issues and, and so on, but uh, not to let the urgent always push the important off the agenda. Well, I'm glad that you brought up that, you know, it's not just a personal endeavor, but it's also a team endeavor to, to really be ensured that your priorities are, are in the right spot. A political career can be stressful, and the last two years have shown anything uh, very hard to determine what, what the right choice for any community is. It's often said that tough times make great leaders. So I want to ask you, based on your experiences, what qualities do you think make a good leader and how did you see that in your team when you were in leadership? Well, let me go. Let me begin right where you were. You were taking us, Sean. Let me begin first. The qualities of a good leader. One of those qualities, I believe, is to recognize that no one leads alone. Um, and this is particularly true in, in, in elected office, whether we're on a council or in a committee, whether we're mayor of a council or reeve of a council. Uh, whether we're a member of the legislature or a member of cabinet or a, a premier or in every level of, of governance, we don't govern alone. We govern with others. And uh, the fact of the matter is we don't get to choose always who it is that we will govern with. And the quality, I think one of the qualities of a good leader is to learn the skill of appreciating and uh, taking advantage of the skills that are part of the team. Uh, recognizing that uh, we're different people, sometimes with different philosophies, but each with a commitment to community, commitment to the work. And one of the tasks of leadership is to, is to, is to build the kind of consensus that can make the team effective. An old friend of mine once said to me, if you find a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. And it's just a fact of the matter that none of us, none of us achieve leadership without the support and help of others. So I think one of the real, um, real tasks of leadership is to build and work with team, which, which leads me then I think to, um, to what I think is another very significant very significant, significant attribute of leadership, and that's just this. Uh, a leader should never ask of others what they will not ask of themselves. A, a general who is not willing to go onto the, the battlefield with her troops uh, is not a solid leader. Uh, so a capacity of leadership, I think, is only asking of others what you will ask of, your, of yourself. Uh, there's many other capacities of leadership, many other strengths that, I, that I've witnessed in others and wouldn't claim them always myself, but uh, certainly witnessed in others. Um, a strong leader, a good leader needs uh, fundamental convictions, convictions that you stand on, convictions that um, don't, don't just move with every shifting wind and fad, uh, convictions that... Um, will stand in the, uh, in, the, in the face of loss, in the adversity of, of loss. You need some convictions. Willingness, of course, to understand the convictions of others and work with others, but to be clear about and understand your, uh, 
your your own convictions. I always, um, when I was in the premier's office, when I was in served in various ministry ministers' offices, um, I always kept close by my desk that that old chestnut that uh, the the poem written by uh, Rudyard Kipling, uh, if. Uh, there is, I think there's just a whole bunch of, um, of leadership advice in that, that, uh, in that poem, you know, um, uh, keep your head while all about are losing theirs, um, be lied about, but don't dwell in lies, talk with crowds, but don't lose your virtue. It goes on and on. And if, I guess if I had my way, I'd, I'd provide a copy of Rudyard Kipling's if to, uh, to every counselor, every mayor, every MLA, every, every premier. The lead by doing mentality is certainly something that sets mayors and councillors up for success. A mayor may be seen as the leader of a community, but they are still just that one voter on the table. And, you know, they have to work together with their team and and make sure that they're willing to kind of put in the work that their councillors are when it comes to leading their community. Across the province, Sestel is engaged with many different municipal organizations who seek to innovate. Contact us to learn more about some of these initiatives and how we can help your municipality today. And now, back to the show. Your tenure as Premier ended 15 years ago, and while many things have changed since then, many things are still the same. Do you still see any challenges from your time as Premier impacting Saskatchewan municipal leaders today? And if so, what are these challenges? Oh, I do, Sean. I do. Um, you know, sometimes the more we change, the more things stay the same. I, leaders today, political leaders in our province today are faced with many of the same, different perhaps, but similar um, concerns about infrastructure, uh, particularly in our province where we're a large geography and a pretty tough climate. This morning, I note the thermometer is about zero or minus 32 below zero. Infrastructure is always an issue for leaders in in this province. Um, I mean, as an example, I my own own hometown of Moose Jaw. I I've watched several councils and mayors uh, deal with the whole question of uh, the lead uh, water pipes and the replacement of of those pipes. I mean, we're reading now that there may well be asbestos pipes uh, in in some or many of our of our communities that uh, may present another future challenge for us. Infrastructure is, is always a challenge, whether it be uh, the highways or the, uh, the alleyways in our community. Uh, the challenges always exist on, on delivering good quality public services, uh, whether it be healthcare services, education, um, recreation, and so many of these services, even those which are provincial responsibilities, uh, end up delivered, of course, in the municipality, uh, delivered on the ground, uh, in the community. And so the partnerships in terms of uh, provincial, federal, and municipal around quality public services, I think are, are on, an ongoing and an essential challenge my own, my own my own philosophy of governance and the role of government is that we don't make social progress we don't don't deliver those quality public services if it's not on the basis of economic progress and the challenges continue and always exist to to make sure that we have good solid well paying jobs and opportunities for our people um, economic strength is the foundation uh, for social strength and the achievement of economic strength, it shouldn't just be for the purpose of economic growth, it should be for the purpose of providing social service and, and quality of life for our people, but uh, the challenges of economic progress. And um, again, I, I repeat, it's um, often the case in building the economy that the rubber hits the road at the municipal level. The new economic developments are occurring locally. And uh, municipal government and the role of municipal leaders in economic development cannot be underestimated, nor should they be put on any kind of a back burner, in my view, by our uh, municipal leaders. So many of the challenges that we faced uh, back those 20 years ago, uh, we, uh, we continue to face today. I'm glad you brought up kind of the economic prosperity piece. 
Many communities are are kind of racking their brains right now, trying to figure out coming out of the COVID pandemic, how do they revitalize their small businesses and how do they make sure that, uh, you know, they're able to have longevity for 10, 20, 30 years into the future to make sure that these small towns are, are still standing and that uh, they're still able to thrive in the same way that they, uh, they did five years ago or, or even kind of even just prior to the pandemic. Talking about how things haven't changed, let's switch gears to how things have changed since 2009. How do you think that things have changed? And what do you think municipal councillors and mayors can learn by looking back at your time in Saskatchewan politics? Well, the changes, uh, ch- changes Sean, are, are many and are dramatic. I, I'm sometimes, um, it, it takes my breath away sometimes when I see the, uh, the change uh, that has occurred in Saskatchewan and in, in the communities of Saskatchewan in just this relatively uh, short period of time. There's been a very significant, of course, demographic change. Our province, uh, interestingly enough, is becoming a very young province. And much of that change, of course, is, is among our, um, our Aboriginal, our First Nation and Métis youth, the fast growing young population in that quarter of our province. Just in the closing years of, of our government, we crafted immigration policy that sought to open the doors of Saskatchewan uh, again to the globe. And it resulted, uh, I think, over these past 20 years in a very significant growth in our population that has come directly uh, from immigration. And it's, it's, it's made, um, it's made our, our province and our communities, and I don't just mean our urban communities, it's made many, many of our communities much more uh, culturally diverse. Uh, all you need to do is look on the shelves of our supermarkets. Uh, all you all you need to do is look at the religious fabric uh, within our within our communities. And again, I say it's not just in urban communities; it's it's province wide. The demographics have changed. We're much more cosmopolitan than we were even even 20 years ago. And I would argue that we are deepening our understanding of the need for reconciliation uh, in our province. That too has been a, I think, a significant and positive change that we have come to understand the need for reconciliation, that we all are treaty people in in this province. And if the future is going to be strong for all of us, we need to to understand that. I think we've also, and and helpfully, uh, come to understand more the, the, um, the dramatic consequences of climate change. And that uh, while we continue to to seek to limit climate change, we also now have reached a point, of point that I believe we need to be thinking clearly about adaptation to climate change. Um, I heard uh, someone say the other day, and I thought it was wise, he said the, the, uh, probably the biggest challenge facing agriculture overall is climate change and how over time we are going to adapt uh, to climate change. And again, many of these issues, uh, the rubber hits the road right at the municipal a municipal level. Level. I uh, uh, thinking about the, the political uh, landscape in Saskatchewan and how it's changed over these past twenty years. Clearly, um, the province has moved from what I would describe as the the center, the political center, um, significantly to the right. Um, not long after my time in government. Um, Howard Leeson edited a a work that compared in some ways our government and the the government of Brad Walls, the early SAS party government, and and they titled the book, um, Crowding the Center. Um, I believe we were a rather centrist government. I believe the early SAS party government was a rather centrist government. But now in more recent times, I see the political political landscape moving to the right. And and I'm, I'm even seeing uh, some of the extreme right, what who I would call the extreme right, beginning to um, to drive the agenda in the province, and and I I think that's uh, that's troubling as we move away from perhaps a more cooperative and community based understanding to uh, to much higher levels of individualism, and and equally troubling to me at least politically is the growing skepticism about our political structures themselves. Um, you know, you know, it's one thing to lose faith in a political party or to lose faith in a current council or a current mayor. It's one thing to lose 
face in that regard. But if we lose faith in our structures and in our systems, uh, if we lose faith that the practice of politics can build that better world and shape the kind of community that we want to live in, if, if we don't have the confidence in our structures and our systems, then we are in trouble because it's, it lends itself then to all sorts of expressions of government. We're going to be governed one way or another. It, we're either going to be governed by, by the power of force or we're going to be governed by the power of money or we're going to be governed by the, by the power of our ballot and by the power of democratic systems. And when I see the rising level of skepticism about our systems, uh, even in Saskatchewan, I, I, I grow concerned. So that's a change I see, and I think it's a, it's a troublesome change. A question we'd like to ask all our guests to end off the interview is, where do you see Saskatchewan heading over the next 10 years, and what do you think leaders need to be doing today to prepare for success tomorrow? Well, I, and again, these are not, for me at least, new convictions. I've I've always believed that um, however we can invest in education, however we can invest in perhaps more narrowly the whole question of literacy and education, uh, these are key components uh, to building the kind of communities and province that we'd, we'd, we'd hope for. Uh, I, uh, I believe economic diversification. We we have a great, we have a wonderful opportunity in Saskatchewan to build on our traditional strengths, and we've done that. And these are these are tend to be in the resource sector, but we cannot take our eye off of that which is important, and, and that is to diversify our economy, to bring out to bring in to find a new opportunities. You know, it, it, this is off subject a little bit. It it kind of chagrins me. When I see that uh, Alberta is attempting to uh, to see itself now as the, uh, the 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 champion of the of a green economy and the growing economies that can be built around um, a green economy, that should be Saskatchewan. For goodness sakes, we should be leading there. Um, adaptation to climate, as I've said, I think that's going to be important as we seek to uh, to build to the uh, future. But perhaps. Uh, Perhaps in my view, the, the most significant component in building a successful future in Saskatchewan, both socially and economically, is we must, we must seek always to heal the growing divides that seem to be dividing us, the, the, the growing divides between people in our province. And it's going to take leadership. This, this, this doesn't happen by accident. It's going to take leadership. And it's going to take some leadership that, that, uh, that brings people together uh, in common purpose and common cause and in common care for one another and not the kind of leadership that fosters division just for some kind of political gain because that's that's easy it's going to take some strong leadership i think to build to build a future that's united and and if i may say because for the most part our our municipal leaders come from a whole variety of political backgrounds and and for the most part uh, are elected and serve without, uh, without a political affiliation. I believe in this regard, our municipal leaders, councillors, mayors, reeves, our municipal leaders may well be best positioned to offer the kind of leadership that brings communities together and then brings the, the province together. I believe our municipal leaders um, have a capacity to bring people together in a way that perhaps others do not. If I could just finish up with one other little comment again, it's not limit, it, it's a bit lighthearted, but it's not really. When I had the opportunity to serve as the Minister of Health, and Minister of Health in any time in our province is not an easy role. It hasn't been particularly easy, of course, over these past couple of years. But when I was the Minister of Health, my father-in-law, Steve Scuzzello, was the mayor of Purdue. And uh, the population of Purdue at that time was about 400 and about 425 people. And I tell you, Sean, um, I think Dad had uh, more hassles on a daily basis than I did as the Minister of Health. Why is that? Because when he walked out his door, he met his constituent. Uh, for our municipal leaders, uh, there is no escape. There is no escape from the very people we seek to represent and do good work on their behalf. 
And so it can be very, very challenging. Municipal government is the government closest to the people. It's where the rubber hits the road. And so the challenges of municipal leadership uh, are as great or greater than uh, other levels of, of governance. And at the same time then, uh, the challenges may be as great, but so I believe are the rewards because it is that engagement with community. It is seeing the result of leadership that happens closest to home and that can be most rewarding. And so I, I'm always encouraging people to think about um, serving in elected office munis at a municipal level. And I'm always appreciative of those who do. Well, Mr. Calvert, um, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate everything you've been able to talk about today. And, you know, I've certainly learned a lot from this conversation, and I know our listeners will have as well. You've brought a wealth of knowledge to the table, and uh, much like your leadership for Saskatchewan, it, it really shows that you're a great resource to tap into. So we really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Sean. Well, this brings us to the end of season two. Looking back on the interviews from season two, there's, there's been a lot of great advice that has come from all of our guests. But one of the main takeaways that I'm going to have from this season is that leadership is about listening. We hope that you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, and I hope that you've taken away as much from this season's guests as I have. It's been an honor working on Municast, and unfortunately, it's time for me to pass the torch. Season 3 will be brought to you by Stephanie Barassa and the rest of the team at SUMA. I want to thank everyone who's listened to this podcast. It's been a great honor to bring you this content, and I know I'm leaving you in good hands with Stephanie. I'd like to wrap up with one final thank you to Sean McKenzie and the entire SUMA team, including Jean-Marc, Stephanie Barassa, Katie Galandi, Cheyenne Gason, Sarah McMillan, Lisa Olson, Augustina Osaseri, and everyone else there. Municast wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for the support that you folks showed me. Signing off from the Sumo office one last time, this is Sean Wiskar. Bye-bye. <laughs>